So from a sponsor perspective, I was always looking for sponsors that I think had a longer duration of experience, ideally had not incurred significant losses or had reasonably managed through you know, certain potentially unavoidable losses during the great financial crisis. So that, that tenure of experience, you know, having 10, 15, 20 years of experience was a great indicator for me as to a sponsor's potential to weather a storm. If you're invested with or considering investing with the sponsor and they got out of college, and this is not a pejorative term against younger people, but they got out of college sometime after the great financial crisis, they have not seen a full cycle in the real estate industry. And that, that's that's matter of fact, right? So I think I'm cautious about people that you know, built their businesses during a extremely high rising tide. And now that the tide is out, I think we're going to get to figure out what those people's true capabilities are to manage through difficult and challenging times in the real estate industry. Hi, Adam Gower here, host of the Real Estate Reality Show on YouTube and also on podcasts everywhere and founder of Gower Crowd. Uh, it, my guest today on the Real Estate Reality Show, Steve Moore of Causeway Advisors. Now, Steve is particular, has a particularly interesting perspective because he has worked hardcore in the uh, real estate crowdfunding world or real estate online syndication world having held a senior position at Real Crowd before they uh, sold to Trinity uh, just a few months ago. In today's episode, uh, Steve is going to talk about the idea that the way through uh, the current turmoil is to stay alive until 25 and whether or not that is a valid strategy or a strategy that he embraces. And he also rattles off a bunch of resources that you can use to access uh, real estate that is uh, discounted, potentially discounted, uh, distressed real estate, but also talks about some very interesting approaches and strategies to finding opportunities during a downturn, particularly this downturn. You'll hear him provide insights into the fundamental difference between the way that sponsors handle acquisitions of distressed real estate versus how they handle uh, acquisitions of real estate during the good times. And he also provides some good insights and advice to accredited investors looking for opportunities to invest in distressed real estate in the coming months. If you like this episode, if you like any of these episodes actually on the Real Estate Reality Show, please go to YouTube, subscribe over there at YouTube, add some comments, or of course, you can join me on LinkedIn, uh, have the conversation over there on LinkedIn. And finally, of course, if you want to know more about Steve Moore and Causeway Advisors and get in touch with them, go to gowercrowd.com, find the podcast page over there. And while you're there, be sure to subscribe to uh, our newsletter. It goes out every Wednesday and we cover everything that's going on in the real estate syndication industry with a particular focus on opportunistic acquisitions and distressed real estate as we head into uh, the latter half of 2023. Uh, that is it for my introduction. Thanks so much for being here. Let me now introduce you to a conversation that I have had with Steve of Causeway Advisors. Here he is. Steve, thanks so much for joining me. I've Super enjoyed chatting to you for half an hour already. <laughs> so we're a little bit behind the curve on the time. So let's try and keep it to half an hour, the average commute. Uh, in America, of course, here in LA, it's about a three hour commute, but between you and me, it's half an hour. Yeah. And uh, the reason I contacted you is a few of your posts on LinkedIn, very interesting. Uh, one in particular talked about you were at a conference. I actually can't remember what the conference was, uh, but you mentioned actually coincidentally working with one of our clients. Uh, and you said he had said something about staying alive till 25. Sure. So why don't you start at the very top? What is that? What is that mentality? Does that mentality speak to you? What does it inform you about how somebody is thinking? What do you think the reality is? 
Yeah, sure. That that is Chris Rising, who, who I know and and have the utmost respect for, as, as well as his father, who was a figure in the industry for a long time. Um, you know, I, I think Chris was talking about the necessity to sort of manage your way through what he anticipates is going to be a challenging period in the commercial real estate industry and stay alive until twenty five. You know, to sort of fend off whatever operational challenges, financial distress may emerge within an existing operator's portfolio is a very valid strategy. And there's plenty of people that are already in the throes of that right now as I speak, and they have been for, for months and even years if you go back to the pandemic causing some distress. Um, and, and while I think that is important, and in some cases, unfortunately necessary from an operator's perspective, from an investor perspective, I think there are opportunities in a disrupted market that we find ourselves in today to put capital to work in ways that will produce potentially outsized returns. If you follow the right strategies, you invest in the right opportunities, you can find yourself in a very advantageous place. During the great financial crisis, I was in investment banking uh, at Citigroup and a firm called Molis, doing a lot of bankruptcy and restructuring work. And you know, at that stage, it was you know much larger um, transactions than than I've been involved in more recently in crowdfunding roles, but you know, uh, big ones like the Lehman Brothers portfolio, General Growth, Centro, these tens of billions of dollar portfolios, and and the investors, the 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 distressed real estate funds that waded into those situations, you know, made absolute fortunes for themselves as as sponsors, absolute fortunes for their LP backers, you know, being intrepid and pushing their way into a disrupted market and finding ways to to derive value, to take control of assets and to generate returns. Yeah, exactly. I'm so glad that you brought that up. That was second part of the uh, <clears throat> of the quote that you put on LinkedIn. So how are investors going to make what was the term used exactly made fortunes for themselves? How yeah. are investors going to do that this cycle? What do you think is headed down the pike? For sure. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, you don't yet have a broad scale disruption in the banking market. So hopefully we won't find ourselves in one of those, although there's been some conspicuous failures. But you have seen because interest rates have moved up, you know, so quickly and, and to such a high level that it's going to cause financial distress among a number of borrowers. And I think the results, the opportunities, while it may not be an RTC like tsunami or even as big as the great financial crisis, it might be more idiosyncratic, more episodic. I think those options, those opportunities are still there. I draw lessons from those major players like a Blackstone, a Brookfield, an Oak Tree, Starwood, Elliott, Apollo, those that were the main players in the great financial crisis. And I think the most important things that you have to do is number one, be proactive. I observed firsthand the fact that they tracked opportunities and did an enormous amount of research. They looked for ways to insert themselves into those processes through dip lending, becoming stocking horse bidders, purchasing different classes of security. So they created proximity for themselves in those transactions. And I think you can draw from those patterns of behavior and apply those to your own personal investing strategies. I think another thing that's important, and this is you know, not news and certainly something that you've covered in your books and in your podcast before, you have to be ready, have your financing in place. You have to be willing to absorb pursuit costs and legal costs. You have to know to some extent and be willing to honor a process. You're buying distressed assets. You're buying generally as is. There's going to be rules if it's an auction. It may be a delayed or prolonged process that could involve some litigation or some legal expenses. Um, and then most importantly, you have to be willing to execute. You know, I talked about being intrepid. This is not passive investing, right? You're, you're having to push your way into these situations to find opportunities in competition with a number of other investors that are going to be pursuing the same or similar strategies. When the processes do materialize, when there's an option to buy, generally speaking, going to move quickly, you know, limited due diligence, maybe limited contingencies, if any. You have to be flexible about how you play. And then I think another thing that's important to understand is that you want to have a value delivery plan on the other side. It's one thing to sort of win the auction, but if you don't know what you're going to do with the asset, whether it's a single family home, an apartment building, or, or something else, if you don't have a plan to deliver value, whether you're going to renovate, flip, sell, you don't want to get into any kind of situation that you don't know how you're going to get out of. So, I mean, I think those are, if I will, being proactive, ready, and willing and able to execute, to me, are the three things, the lessons that I draw from that experience in the great financial crisis that can be applied in this situation. 
Wow, what a, an exceptional uh, response to my question. In fact, you've leapfrogged over <clears throat> a bunch of other questions that I have. Let's come back to sure. the, you know, to this idea of what, first of all, what do buyers, active buyers need to do? Which are the sponsors, right? Mm -hmm. Themselves, the, the, the professional real, it's always, it's, I'm always struggling with the terms. Investor can mean anybody, but a professional sure. real estate, somebody who does it all the time, sponsor. And, and how should accredited investors, those that get the opportunity to invest with those guys, uh, what sh how should their mindset be? But let's come back to those. Because what I wanted to ask you first was, now you were at Real Crowd sure. uh, for a while, uh, now Trinity, and you handle developer acquisition. We were talking about developers screening them and deciding who you guys were going to uh, actually back. So presumably of every one that you actually went with, there were... 10x, 20x, I don't know a lot, probably 20 times as many that you decided not to go with. So with that in mind and what you saw during those times, you mentioned that with interest rates having gone up as fast as they have, it's caused a lot of turmoil. What else is going to cause distress in this market? Thinking about what you saw when you were at Real Crowd with the sponsors that came through the door that you said no to. Yeah, for sure. I, I think um, just to delineate, we, we had one aspect of our business called Reallocate that was focused on principal investing where we were underwriting investments. On the real crowd marketplace side, we did a level of diligence on sponsors. And I think the things that we focused on with the sponsors was number one, first and foremost, track record. Uh, while we didn't necessarily require it, I was very focused on the duration of that track record. And I always took comfort from sponsors that were in the business prior to the great financial crisis, had experience moving through both a down and an up market. And I think that's critically important, something that investors should be mindful of, particularly if they're investing with a sponsor who is pursuing distressed assets. Also, I think it's something, you know, one thing about uh, distress investing is you don't accidentally want to be investing in distress. So I think it's also something that you <laughs> should think about within your own portfolio of existing exposures. If you've already, you have an investor that has some crowdfunding exposures in their portfolio now, I think it's an important time to, you know, ask certain questions about that sponsor's capability to manage in a challenging environment because now funding costs are up. You're having operational distress. You know, do you say, for instance, have you invested in an opportunity zone, a development deal that's going to slow down now? The sponsor is going to start to slow walk it. So from a sponsor perspective, I was always looking to sponsors that I think had a longer duration of experience, ideally had not incurred significant losses or had reasonably managed through, you know, certain potentially unavoidable losses during the great financial crisis. So that that tenure of experience, you know, having 10, 15, 20 years of experience was a great indicator for me as to a sponsor's potential to weather a storm. If you're invested with or considering investing with a sponsor and they got out of college, and this is not a pejorative term against younger people, but they got out of college sometime after the great financial crisis, they have not seen a full cycle in the real estate industry. And that, that's that's matter of fact, right? So I think I'm cautious about people that you know built their businesses during a extremely high rising tide and now that the tide is out i think we're going to get to figure out what those people's true capabilities are to manage through difficult and challenging times in the real estate industry okay so let me to drill down on that a little bit what yeah. is it about not having the experience of a downturn that is um you know <clears throat> i mean we all know what it is i want you to articulate why is that not a good thing when you go into a downturn what kind of mistakes can novice investors make? And, and did you see that caused you to reject them as options for real crowd? Yeah, I, I think, you know, not having that duration or depth of experience to me, it's it's a perceptual issue, but, you know, do, do investors, you know, do they know how to finance or refinance a deal that say is coming out of certificate of occupancy that's leasing up when interest rates aren't near zero? Do their numbers pencil out? Do they have the underwriting discipline to have not overpaid for investments? Have they not taken on too much leverage? Is their leverage levels prudent? Um, are, are they durable? You know, did, Were the LTVs so high when they initiated the deal that they're now going to have trouble if there's a revaluation? Um, did they put caps on their interest rates or did they just think interest rates were gonna be you know, functionally near zero from a reference rate for the entire duration of the hold? 
you know, those types of things to me are, you know, we, we would ask about, you know, uh, interest rate hedge programs, things like that, that would indicate a higher level of sophistication on the part of a sponsor as we're considering them for, you know, the, the sort of prudence of those types of investments, the, the, you know, the compatibility of those with our investment structures that we like to put on our marketplace on a proprietary side, investment structures that we would feel comfortable making a recommendation for investors to go into. And do you think this is where um, distress is going to come from? Is going to be those, uh, I mean, you said college, but what you meant was kind of non-multi-cycle, uh, kind of new to the industry sponsors. Is that where you think the distress is going to come? You talked about interest rates. That's the catalyst. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Is, is, I, I, I think to answer that, I, I'd say I, I don't necessarily think that, you know, sponsors with less duration of track record or, or you know, are more exposed. It just was comforting to me to have seen someone that had come through a challenging cycle. A lot of talented young sponsors out there that are making interesting deals happen. They're doing it with a degree of rigor and financial discipline that I would find sort of combat compatible, if you will, with my own personal investment philosophies. And those I'd be willing to follow despite sort of that lack of duration of their track record. The things that I think will be catalysts for distress, you know, they vary a little bit by asset classes. Um, you know, office, multifamily, I think the things that will cause the stress in the space are different. But, you know, any deal that you're investing in uh, or, or invested in currently that is going to be, you know, a short duration, you know, it's nearing its sale or exit date. If there's some reason to be compelled to sell, if it's a development deal uh, and you have a, you know, a sort of time frame associated with delivery, will they be delivering into a soft market for retail assets, office assets or multifamily even? Um, you know, within the deals that you currently own, or if you're buying into a deal that's a recap, are there financing needs? Is there maturing debt that is going to have to be refinanced at what level and in what time frame? You know, everybody's got a different view on interest rates and sort of what the future will bring. But I think it's fair to say that any deal that was done, you know, prior to 18 months ago has probably got a lower interest rate than is going to be available for any kind of a refinancing near term. And within that envelope of capital considerations, is there floating rate debt? Is it uncapped? Uh, you know, what are the mechanisms in the documentations of the deals, whether you're considering a prospective deal or one that you're invested in for capital calls or the provisions for additional equity capital? The banks or the lenders require them to equitize those things. Those are the important points that I think investors want to pay attention to. And if you're on the other side of that, sponsors you want to be thoughtful about is you're crafting your deal documents. If you're buying things now, making sure that there are provisions for those types of you know, re-equitization or capital calls if it's necessary, how you can bring new equity into a deal or new financing into a deal. You need to do that to make it work in order to get to the other side. So I'm not sure if that addresses your question, but those are some of the things, the pinch points that I'm kind of looking at when I'm evaluating a transaction, um, you know, for my own investment purposes or when I was doing it for real crime. Now, you also described just a few moments ago in some uh, excellent detail uh, what uh, sponsors, how sponsors need to kind of adjust their um, modus operandi when they're buying distress. It's very different from buying a marketed property during an up market and distress the world is very, very different. So let's talk now about how accredited investors, again, coming from this crowdfunding world uh, that we uh, both have inhabited, I still do and you do to some extent, Sure. Uh, but uh, so accredited passive investors who are out there thinking, you know what, you maybe we've seen some losses, we know that there's some struggling going on, taking a step back, but we want to move forwards with two steps, right, with uh, taking mm -hmm. advantage of some of these distressed opportunities. What should they be looking at and how should they be preparing, do you think, for deals that are going to look different um, qualitatively than... Sure the usual package deals that they've been used to uh, mm -hmm. in the last, you know, since the Jobs Act over the last eight years or so? For sure. I, I think, again, <laughs> the first place that I would start is in your existing portfolio and make sure that you don't think there's, you know, a potential instance of distress that's coming your way with the stuff that you already own. That's that's my first level of scrutiny that I would apply. I think within the crowdfunding, crowdfunding space, as it has evolved, we're likely to see elements of distressed investing coming through some of the familiar channels. I think you'll see, you know, some of the, the and then this is speaking broadly about investment opportunities that are available to accredited investors, B-REIT, S-REIT, C-REIT, 
KKR, Apollo, all the, the, the investing products that they have, they will be pursuing distress. And frankly, we'll be pursuing at probably a higher level than is available to a typical crowdfunding investor. I think also there are some funds out there. And, and while I wouldn't presume to make any specific recommendations, there are you know some uh, accredited investor-oriented vehicles that are being created specifically to pursue distressed investing. Um, one that I'll mention that I think just came over was Fundrise and has announced they're going to do a $500 million credit fund with a focus on distress. There's a crowdfunding platform called Second RE, which is looking at secondary sales. So I think you might start to see some of these positions trading back and forth. I think those types of opportunities you'll start to see in these you know, the typical prominent crowdfunding platforms, more distressed opportunities. Um, outside of that crowdfunding those crowdfunding vehicles, I think, you know, there's an opportunity to buy loans from banks. It's very intensive and it requires a lot of proactive effort. You know, there are syndicators who sell non-performing loans of various sorts. I think those are available. There are investment opportunities from hard money lenders that I think will come into prominence as bank debt is less available. Um, fund that flip and a few others, I think will start to orient their focus more towards providing gap funding, or uh, renovation funding or some sort of a bridge funding for deals that are in financial distress. I think you can look at um, tax liens. You know, that, that's obviously an area where you can uh, find a way to deploy some capital. Uh, I've seen some interesting strategies around HOA receivables, which really, it was news to me, but there's 16 states where apparently HOA receivables can get a super priming lien on a home. So you know, if the HOA receivables are factored and sold, that person can pursue sort of a quiet foreclosure and try to get hold of an asset. So if you've got somebody that, and this is not happening at scale yet, but in the great financial crisis, people were abandoning homes. You go in and buy that lien, you know, the HOA receivable, and essentially take control if the bank was asleep at the switch and didn't sort of pay you par plus accrued interest on that. So that's an interesting strategy that I think will come back into prominence here. You know, there will be announced sales of REOs, short sales, HUD homes, HUDHomesUSA.org is where they do their listings there. Um, one strategy that I think is going to become very interesting, and I think you'll start to see it play out in uh, uh, the, the crowdfunding space or just sort of in syndicated real estate investments writ large, will be mid-construction projects that have gotten stalled for lack of funding. Um, and that's everything from spec homes that are being built by a developer that's now upside down. That's something you're much more likely to hear about from your local banker than any other source, that this person that has five or six or a dozen homes in the market that they've been building, they're mid-construction on them and they've run out of funding. So the opportunity to take over those projects or infuse some equity into those projects will exist. I think that will exist at a higher scale. Um, I think also things that I, I tend to, to find interesting sources are you know, headlines and business failures and bankruptcies for non-real estate companies. A lot of times there is an embedded component of real estate that can provide an interesting investment opportunity inside of that uh, uh, without betraying confidences. An example of that is I was talking to a real estate sponsor who was given a list essentially of the private real estate holdings of one of the senior executives of a bank that failed recently. And that person now needs liquidity and they are liquidating their real estate holdings in order to provide that for themselves. You know, that's sort of episodic distress. I think um, another avenue that I'm interested in are, you know, firms like uh, Hillco and Keen Summit are, are very prominent 363 sales. So this is assets that are being sold out of bankruptcy, um, you know, to fund cash flowing shortfalls. And they, they deal with a lot of real estate programs. You can go to their sites and see, you know, right now there's hotels being offered, shopping centers, land development. So I think there's going to be... Um, a lot of different entry points, if you will, and you know, I've listed a dozen or so here in rapid succession. If you missed a few, rewind the podcast. You can read. <laughs> <laughs> well, you didn't but, forget that Gower Crowd is trying to find some deals as well. I'm just, sure. I just want to stick that in, just in case uh, anybody didn't realize. But yeah, go on. And I, and, I, and I do think there will be, as with Gower Crowd, a number of different entry points to participate in the stress. I think it's important for you, as I mentioned, to kind of go into it with a bit of a battle plan, so to speak. Um, make sure that you, you know, are comfortable investing on a basis. And generally speaking, in the success case, you'll be able to deliver to yourself outsized returns. Um, I, I do think it, again, it's not a passive mode of investing, you know, and, and you've got to ask yourself, I think as an investor, is the juice worth the squeeze? Am I willing to kind of take the ride for something that's going to take much longer 
to ideally in a success case realize higher return. But I, I do think there'll be numerous ways for people to gain exposure to it. It's just going to require them to be a bit more proactive because by the time you know those distress listings are readily available, they've probably been passed over by everyone else. So there's a selection bias against probably what makes it all the way through the filters to the more commercially conspicuous opportunities for investing. Yes, that's very interesting you say. It's the off-market stuff where you've got the right leads and the right contacts. You've yeah. turned, up, uh, turned over every stone to find the opportunities. Just for clarification, what we're looking for, uh, Steve, is uh, through our developer network. Sure. They, they're bringing opportunities to us that they need to finance. And so the idea is to um, ca capitalize those opportunities of uh, sponsors. So investors will be passive. They will yep. look at a deal in the same, not, not to go out and buy a deal directly and deal with it themselves, especially MPL, non-performing loans. Uh, it's a very specialized area. This is a very, very tough area. You can make fortunes as, as, you, as yep. you've said before, but it's a tough area. It, it, I, I like that strategy a lot. And I, I think you hit on what I consider a very, important facet of that type of investing, which is investors need to determine for themselves what their comfort level is from an, an intensity of effort perspective. And, and I am, you know, as, as someone who has spent uh, uh, his, the majority of his career as an intermediary, and it's a bit of a self-serving comment, but I'm a very big fan of finding sponsors, intermediaries, such as you suggested with Gower Crowd, who can help you navigate this because it's a very complex uh, you know, it's a very complex style of investing and, you know, nothing, you know, no, no outside rewards will come with a little, little bit of outside risk. But one way to mitigate that risk is to align yourself behind strategies that are being presented by capable sponsors or capable intermediaries like yours. Well, that's it. And that's the point, isn't it? It's exactly what a crowdfunding is or sure. syndication, right? Everything that you worked on at Real Crowd, just think about the good times. Sponsor has a, you know, an, a value add multifamily deal. <clears throat> needs 10 million for it and so you syndicate it to you know two three hundred individual investors that process itself isn't any different with distress the difference is it's distress so the pitch if you like and it's a kind of a crass term but the way it's presented to investors or what investors should expect to get is going to be very different there'll be no flashy flyers no flashy deal memos you got to close on Friday, so you need to make a decision quickly, right? It's a different world, but you still will have the opportunity to invest 25,000, whatever the minimum is, alongside another 100 people so that you can finance a distressed deal. You've just got to have the confidence that the sponsor knows what they're doing. That's the, that's the thesis. Yeah. So, um, uh, Steve, let me ask you this. Um, um, let's start, I've actually... Let's uh, let's uh, start moving to wrap up. I, I want to talk to you a lot more, right? Basically, so we'll do that offline, or maybe we'll get you back on or something. But for today's show, um, one of the first things again, let's get back to this: stay alive until twenty-five. Yes. <clears throat> so, what is the timing of what you think is going to happen? We are now. I'm going to date stamp this thing. I don't usually do that. Basically, moving into Q3 2023, so mm -hmm. the second half of the year. Um, what do you think is the uh, the timing for distress? The interest rates maybe have flattened, maybe go up. Little chance they'll go down before the end of the year. Mm -hmm. what, what 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 are your views about timing and when these opportunities are going to materialize? Uh, and will it be over by twenty five? Do you think? Um, in that sense, I think uh, maybe not completely over by 25, because some of these processes have a very long duration. But that's where I do find some alignment with Chris's comment, the stay alive till 25, because I think that's when the sun will start shining. Um, uh, you know, in terms of interest rates, I took a look at my crystal ball today. It, it tells me that the Fed will start cutting either you know, just before or just after uh, the, the first of the year. I'd be surprised if it's before. I think the consensus is around, you know, uh, early next year. I, I think, um, you know, some of that will be that they're seeing beneficial indicators and there's sort of inflation tracking. Uh, you know, cynically speaking, I think another part of it is they're going to want to create some upwinds in the economy going into the election cycle. So there's always that psychology associated with it. But I do feel like you'll start to see interest rate reductions you know, throughout 2024 uh, uh, that are going to be beneficial. Um, 
I think, you know, kind of coming back to your question though, distress processes, you know, they tend to be a bit elongated, right? Because the first thing that people try to do is that stay alive. And, and when that fails, when they reach that point where they've got the gun to their head, where the rug's been pulled out or whatever your, your, your chosen metaphor is, um, that's when things proceed to a short sale, a 363 sale, a bankruptcy filing, something that's going to be a catalytic event, a foreclosure. And, and those processes themselves can be, you know, because they're somewhat litigious, can be long dated. So I think, you know, what you'll find is even after the economy starts to recover, and if that starts to happen in 2024, interest rates are going down, financing is becoming more readily available. You'll still see assets, sponsors, assets, portfolios, whatever, that are caught up in that process of distress, and they won't be able to escape it. So those investment opportunities still persist a little bit after the broader market economy has turned. You know, by then, a lot of people will be obviously chasing them, and you'll have a lot of competition for them. But that, that's my view, is that I think that you're, you're already seeing some large-scale real estate distress. I think the smaller-scale real estate distress that would be available for accredited investors will start to happen here relatively quickly. It's already happening at a scale, but, but you're already seeing some cracks in the system. And then that will accelerate into, as you mentioned, third quarter this year, the back half of this year, and into the beginning of next year. And then things will start to turn around sometime in 2024. By 2025, the regular way real estate investing will be you know, back to what will be a new normal of stability. But there'll still be these distressed opportunities as they go through a foreclosure process, which takes a long time, if they go through a receivership or some other type of process that's going to be time intensive. So you've got, you know, realistically 12 to 18 months to kind of participate in this type of an investment strategy. And then I think, you know, you'll have attractive appealing opportunities outside of what might be termed distress that'll start to divert investors' attention. Uh, you know, it just occurred to me, I'm taking notes here. Um, it just occurred to me, one big difference between this time and the GFC is that during the global financial crisis, everyone calls it the great. I think that's just an American. Sure. Thing. I always thought of it as the global, but anyway, whatever. Uh, no one predicted when it was be over. Everybody, yeah. It was like a falling sword at all times. Like it was this dark tunnel with yeah. no sense of light. There's no question that there is, that there is this sense that we're hitting a bump yeah. and that it will be over and it's almost predictable. It's an interesting difference, actually. Um, yeah. Let, let me wrap up with two questions. Sure. Um, I've been dying to ask you this one. Uh, I don't know, I don't normally admit this. I'm going to admit it anyway, but I was actually uh, LAPD uh, for 14 years. I know. And, uh, there were a lot of uh, army guys and uh, services guys that, uh, that I worked along side uh, when I was doing that. I was a reserve, line reserve, but 24 uh, seven, sure. police officer status. So my question to you is, um, not sure what you did, it doesn't say it, but uh, on LinkedIn, US Army, John F. Kennedy, Special Warfare Center and School. What have you learned? What did you learn then that you can apply <laughs> to the world today? Um, so yeah, when I was a much younger, thinner man, I, I went through the Army Special Forces program, got my Green Beret, Air Board and all that fun stuff. Um, you know, look, it's a very dynamic environment. It teaches you to be flexible or, or fluid, as we would like to say, because flexible is too rigid. Um, and I think I've kind of carried that as well as some of the other leadership lessons, uh, you know, through my career and, and try to apply them wherever appropriate to situations. Um, and, I, and I do feel like it's, it's a good, uh, much like law enforcement, it's a good preparation for um, understanding people, understanding dynamic situations and recognizing you know, the need to act thoughtfully, but what also quickly to take advantage of opportunities. And you know, there's probably more parallels than you would think in, you know, special operations activities, small unit tactics to business than in the leadership lessons that underpin both of those that many people would appreciate. You know, you've got to build a plan and act on it. And as soon as you get into it, of course, the plan gets blown up and then you've got to rely on your capabilities to adapt to the situation as it presents itself and move forward regardless of the impediments and understand that, you know, that, that that's the mission and, and being task focused and accomplishing the mission is your key goal. Yeah, phenomenal. That, <clears throat> that is a lesson for this market, if, if yeah. nothing else, sure. Last question, Steve. Okay, sure. so to keep tuned in to what's going in the commercial real estate industry and markets, 
what resources do you like to uh, lean on uh, and yeah. refer to? Um, big believer in the old adage that your network is your net worth, right? Like staying close to, you know, both your colleagues in the industry, other investors, but also intermediaries. We talked a little bit about brokers and builders and developers and bankers and lawyers and accountants. I think having those relationships is going to help you pre-run the market and identify opportunities. Um, you know, for me, I, I look at a lot of public market information from S&P, NAV Navigator, Bloomberg, TREP, DebtWire, the Mortgage Bankers Association, I like a lot. Um, uh, but also, I mean, I think the real estate brokerage reports, there's a lot of real estate specific news and research sources like Globe Street and the Real Deal and the Real Estate Alert and Green Street and STR and Hotel News that I follow and consume. I feel like the mainstream press has had a lot of commercial real estate uh, you know, stories of late, to be honest, I think from an investment opportunity perspective, there's a lag when something gets picked up by the Wall Street Journal to when it was kind of main known through the real estate press. So I think pushing into those sort of real estate specific sources are good. And then, you know, primary research, tax records, property records, bank foreclosure records, notices of, uh, you know, legal action, I think can be good indicators if you're paying attention to the right sources to try to identify opportunities. But it's sort of it in a nutshell, both macro and micro for me. Steve Moore, Causeway Advisors, LLC. Thank you so much for joining me on uh, the show today. Really, real pleasure meeting you. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Well, that was Steve Moore of Causeway Advisors. And that was a fascinating conversation. Steve, as you heard, shared uh, a lot of uh, very interesting insights and suggestions where you can go and do some follow-up research, uh, what kind of resources you can use, and also some really interesting uh, angles on how to find opportunities. Of course, here at Gower Crowd, we're going to be tapping into our developer network uh, to bring you opportunities to, uh, to invest in. So if you're a developer, uh, do please uh, be in touch. If you see something that you like, opportunistic acquisition that you like, that you want to finance, we will do our best to uh, to help you do that, either directly or through a JV or some other way. We'll help you find the capital for that. And if you are an accredited investor, boom, go to gowercrowd.com. Be sure to subscribe to our newsletter. Hit the button that says accredited investor, and we will send you a lot of high-value educational information. Distressed real estate is not easy to handle and to master. You've really got to have some expertise in it. It takes some finesse, but it is absolutely worth the effort. Okay, that's it for today. Steve, what a pleasure meeting you. I'm looking forward to following up with you and staying in touch. Uh, I do anticipate that there may be other ways that we can work together other than just recording podcasts. And to you, dear viewers, thank you for showing up today. Really appreciate it. Hope you've enjoyed the show today. Do tell your friends about it and uh, colleagues, if you liked it, uh, to tune in as well. But for today... Uh, this is the end of the show. Thank you so much for showing up. And for now, this is Adam Gower signing off.